Good morning, Klaus. Nobody online yet. <coughs> so, oh, oh, hello, Temi. Hi, Teresa. Hi, Rebecca. So I'll start by just showing you the notes I put together for a new chapter that I'm starting. Uh, because we finished up on chapter nine as far as I'm concerned. Unless you have questions and post them, I'm just going to assume we're done with that. I also assume that you're trying to work on your uh, questions <clears throat> your 100 questions or your 80 questions, however many you want to do. Hi, Justin. And uh, right now I'll just show you what I put together for chapter 11 so far. This is a chapter on intermolecular forces. It's not one I ever formally cover, but I think it's important to uh, just uh, go through the, the, the different uh, parts of the, at least the notes of that. I won't actually do the chapter, but I'll show you the notes I put together. So this is top of page one, second half of page one. It should be somewhat familiar to you. Top of page two, second half of page two. Top of half of page three. second half of page three. Again, if you watch it on television, you'll be able to see it clearly enough that you can uh, copy the notes. Top half of page four. And you'll see a flow chart there that summarizes all the intermolecular forces and which one prevails under various circumstances, and there's it's as far as I got. Phase changes from liquid to solid to gas, or from gas straight to solid. And back and forth. So what are intermolecular forces? They are the forces that occur between molecules. Um, first of all, there are three easily recognizable phases of matter, gas, liquid, and solid. So the highest kinetic energy is found in the gases, of course. And if you see in the notes that I, I gave you, I list the uh, melting points or, or uh, um, boiling points of, of, a, of a particular substance, dinitrogen oxide. It's a gas at 25 degrees Celsius. It's a liquid at negative 88. Hi, Sibiwe. And it's a um, solid at negative 90. So that obviously the colder it gets, the more uh, solid the object, the, the, the substance becomes. Why is that? Well, because there are intermolecular forces that attract the molecules one to the other. When the molecules have a high kinetic energy, those forces aren't enough to hold it together. But once you start cooling them down and reducing the average kinetic energy, energy of the molecules that are involved, uh, they start to stick together and eventually they can form a, a crystal. There are three types of forces you should know about that all come under the umbrella of Van der Waals forces. They are the um, dipole-dipole interactions, London dispersion forces, and hydrogen bonding, which is the one that you're most familiar with. The London dispersion forces are due to momentary disturbances in the electron cloud. They're due to momentary asymmetries um, over time. It's kind of like a wave propagating through a crowd. If you have all the electrons that are supposed to be close to an, um, the uh, nucleus of an atom all distributed to one side of the atom, you, you basically have got a naked positive charge on one side and a bunch of negative charge on the other. That creates a slight asymmetry in the, in the charge distribution, builds a momentary dipole, which can then affect the high uh, time. It can momentarily affect the the symmetry of the cloud next to next to it in another molecule and that can 
uh, it can uh, gradually, um, gradually, it instantaneously transmits through the bulk of the molecules and it creates a, a propagating disturbance that creates a, a, a minute attraction between molecules. In substances that don't have things like hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole forces, that's the only thing that causes the molecules to, uh, to solidify or, or liquefy at very low temperatures. So that's, that's the kind of uh, force that causes oxygen to become liquid at minus 186. Hi, Teresa. Yes, they're posting, they're already posted. They're at the beginning of this video. You just have to pause the video and then you'll see them. They're all, the first 30 seconds or first minute of this video, all the notes will be there. You just watch it on a TV. You'll be able to write them down. I don't actually have, um, I suppose I could uh, try to uh, scan them and then just put them on a website. I could do that too. I'll, I'll look into that. But I think it's better for you to copy them. Actually, it's actually a better way of doing it because then you, you learn it more effectively. Getting back to the lesson then. Um, you can also have what are called ion dipole dipole forces. So you can have, for example, when a sodium ion dissolves in water or a, cl a sodium chloride dissolves in water, you get both sodium ions and, and chloride and ions. How is it that those ions are staying in the aqueous solution? It's because of ion dipole forces. Wa water is capable of creating, it has a dipole, right? Water, as you know. Um, If you look at water molecule, because of the large electronegativity difference between the oxygen atom and, and the hydrogen atom, you get a slight charge buildup negative with the oxygen atom. Hydrogen has a positive charge. If you put a, a chloride anion in solution, what's happening is the water molecules are presenting the positive side the, with the hydrogen atom to the chloride anion. And so the water has a shell of the, the chloride ion has a shell of water molecules around it that help to dissipate the negative charge of the chloride ion. Now, if you look at the sodium cation, what you get is the other end of the molecule presenting to the, uh, to the ion. So, for example, for sodium, you'll get the oxygen atoms being turned towards the ion and forming a shell around it to solvate the ion. Looks like that. That's delta. That's the Greek letter delta, lowercase, and it, it, it what it shows is a small uh, numerical quantity. So uh, dipole dipole forces are uh, happen are what keep neutral molecules attracted to each other. So when the positive end of one is attracted to the negative end of the other, that's what happens with water. Water molecules stick together like little magnets because of that dipole-dipole force. And hydrogen bonding is a particularly strong form of dipole-dipole interaction. You see this force in proteins. Uh, it's the reason you can style your hair by wetting it. Um, we, we sort of take it for granted, but it's a force. It's a low-level force, but it's so ubiquitous. Wherever you have water, the force can have an effect on the um, on what you could do with, with materials. And also, incidentally, it's the reason why ice has a larger volume than liquid water, which has the fortunate effect of... Hi, El Dino. Um, which has the, uh, the fortunate effect of causing ice to float because it forms a crystal that is of a lower density than water. If ice didn't float, it would be disastrous because it would kill all the life in the pond every winter. Let me just give you an example of how when a molecule has a highly polarizable cloud of electrons, especially when it has large atoms like bromine, chlorine, iodine, what happens is it makes the molecule kind of squishy and easily, more easily polarizable. And that easy polarizability lends it the capacity to stick to other molecules that are like itself. So let me show you a little trend. On page 448, they ask you to uh, rank a series of molecules according to uh, the polarizability of their electron clouds and the strength of the resulting dispersion forces. 
And then I took the liberty of looking up the melting points and the boiling points, the actual melting and boiling points of the molecules, and I'll show you whether or not it was right. So they gave you a list of molecules, CBR4, CCL4, uh, and methane. And turns out, well, not the three, but the four, turns out the polarizability is the highest with uh, tetrabromomethane, followed by tetrachloromethane, followed by methane. And the strength of dispersion forces, so uh, this is a polarizability. Strength of dispersion, London dispersion forces. Again, same order. And now I looked up the melting points. of these molecules. So tetrabromomethane melts at 94.5 degrees. Tetrachloromethane melts at negative 22.92 degrees. And methane, why do I keep on putting, methane um, melts at negative 182.5. So you see the one, the one that has the strongest forces also has the highest melting point. And then boiling points follow a similar pattern. Tetrabromomethane melts at 189.7. Uh, tet tetrachloromethane at 76.72. And uh, methane melts at negative 161.5. So again, uh, the London dispersion forces are biggest in the molecules that have large atoms that have large electron clouds. Also, since uh, fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen are highly electronegative atoms, you remember they're at the top of the electronegativity series, they are capable of forming H bonds uh, in, uh, and they generally, when you find them with hydrogen bound to them, then you have a dipole in the molecule. So F-O-N and oxygen is present a lot of times. What? Say that again? I missed that. On practice example, on page 450, I'll show you what I'm just mentioning. Practice example, page 450. It gives you a list of molecules. Which of the following can hydrogen bond? So they show you uh, chloromethane. Actually, it's dichloromethane. I think that's called phosphine, phosphorus trihydride. Uh, peroxide and acetone so the only molecules that can hydrogen bond are the ones that have F O and N the top three most electronegative elements and uh, that would give you only peroxide Carbon is not electro electronegative enough to create a dipole here with hydrogen, or at least not an important one. Uh, oxygen is not directly connected to hydrogen and acetone. Phosphorus is not electronegative enough to create a significant dipole. So the only molecule that can hydrogen bond is peroxide. So peroxide can form H bonds. Like I said before, hydrogen bonds 
play an important role in many chemical systems. They stabilize proteins, are responsible for how DNA carries genetic information, and they make light ice uh, less dense than water. On page 452 of the, of the book, uh, there's a flow chart that I'd like you to take a look at, and it, it lists the uh, five different forces that will help to hold, that come under the umbrella of intermolecular forces. Actually, no, that's wrong. Um, only four of the five, because ionic bonding is an actual uh, bonding force. But uh, dispersion forces, dipole, dipole, hydrogen bonding, and ion dipole ca are categorized as intermolecular forces. So look at that flow chart when you have a moment. On a practice example of page 453, uh, it lists you three different molecules, and it asks you what type of forces are holding those molecules together. Between molecules, I mean, not within the molecules, but intermolecular uh, forces. So this is practice example, page 453. So they gave you ethane, methanol, and uh, ethanol. All three of these can be held together by dispersion forces. So uh, all of them have electron clouds, and electron clouds can be polarized in all molecules. Typically, though, if the molecules are longer, there's more molecule to play with and more possibility of creating uh, um, polarization. And then also, the closer the molecules can get together, the more the effect can have a uh, the capacity to hold the molecules together. That's why whenever you have long chains of mo uh, long chained alkanes, I always say that they can be stacked together like Pringles potato chips, and it's precisely because they can be put close together that the weak London dispersion forces have the capacity of holding the molecules together. These molecules never have very high melting points uh, compared to some other molecules like ionic compounds. Like if you look at salt, at salt sodium chloride melts at around 700 degrees Celsius, but uh, an alkane of comparable molecular mass would easily melt in the, at a couple hundred degrees at most. Right, uh, most organic substances uh, can even go into the sub-zero temperatures to melt because the forces holding the molecules together are pretty weak. So you got to really cool them down before those forces are strong enough to hold the molecules together. There's another uh, okay. So all of them have dispersion forces. And uh, because these ones have Hydrogen atoms attached to an oxygen, they're also capable of H bonding. And that's precisely why both methanol and ethanol are 100% miscible in water. There is no proportion of methanol water that doesn't mix together. You can have 1090 or 9010. They will com always completely mix together because of the possibility of hydrogen bonding. The water molecules and the methanol or ethanol have a strong interaction with each other so you can mix them in any proportion. Two things we should know about are called viscosity and surface tension. Viscosity is of, uh, is of importance to people in the uh, petroleum industry because when you have a car engine you have to know exactly what the oil is doing inside the engine. Uh, those parts of of a say of an internal combustion engine are moving up and down sometimes at thirty to sixty times per second. If your if your car is going at three thousand RPM, the pistons are moving up and down in the pist inside the cylinder fifty times in one second. So if those metal surfaces touch, they'll destroy each other. They have there has to be a film of oil between the me between the metal surfaces to both dissipate friction and heat. And as soon as that oil layer breaks down, you get uh, you, you destroy your engine. You the parts start the parts overheat. The engine will seize, or if it doesn't seize, it'll wear out so badly that it'll, the car will start leaking gases as it's running, and it won't. Uh, it, it'll lose power. You'll get carbon buildup in places where you're not supposed to have it, and you'll have a badly running engine as well. It'll get fouled. 
So there's two, two things that are, are, are especially important to people in the petroleum industry. They are viscosity and um, surface tension. So what is viscosity? Viscosity is a measure of the resistance of a liquid to flow. It's determined by how fast a steel ball falls through a liquid. It has units of uh, kilogram meters per second, which uh, which is um, kilogram meters per second is force. No, meters per second squared is acceleration. Um, that's, that's momentum. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not force, it's, it's momentum. Kilogram meters per second is momentum. So it's a, the, the units of viscosity are the same as the units of momentum. So basically viscosity dissipates momentum. It makes, makes sense. It's like momentum in reverse. It's like the friction against the momentum. So when, a, when a, a ball bearing is falling through oil at a constant velocity, it's not picking up speed because the, uh, the oil is dissipating its momentum. So that's how they measure it. It's kind of like uh, analogous to, uh, it's analogous to the ohm as compared to the volt. The volt is a measure of how much power electrons have, whereas the resistance of a circuit is a measure of how much energy is dissipated as the circuit uh, pushes electrons through it. So in the ideal circuit, you want low resistance so that you don't lose energy through uh, friction. Then there's surface tension. Surface tension is the energy required to increase the area of a liquid. I don't want you to worry about these things. I can, I can already feel your vibes. You're already freaking out. I'm not going to test you on this stuff. I'm just giving you some definition, so relax. By unit amount. It has units of uh, joules per meter squared. So if you ever notice surface tension, if you if you just waxed your car and you drop some water on the car, you get little beads of water. The water the water stays up in little semicircles. Why does that happen? It's because water molecules have attraction. They have cohesive forces holding the water molecules together, and it literally pulls the water molecule until those forces are equaled by the, outwar, the outward pressure of the water molecules wanting to flatten. And they measure that in joules per meter squared. So to actually flatten out the water, you'd have to apply force. I'm not going to actually give you any problems on that, so don't worry. It's just so that you know what the difference between viscosity and surface tension. Then it asks you on... Uh, uh, give it some thought, which by the way, forms the acronym GIST. Very interesting. Don't think it's accidental either. So chapter 11, page 454. How do viscosity and surface tension change? A, as temperature increases, B, as intermolecular forces of attraction become stronger. How do, how do viscosity and surface tension change as temperature increases? And B, as intermolecular forces of attraction become stronger.
viscosity and surface tension will decrease as temperature increases. That's probably why you want to use hot water when you wash things. It's also the reason why they tell you not to use hot water with power washers, because with power washers, you got these rubber seals. You're operating the thing at a thousand pounds per square inch. If you push hot water with those kind of seals, um, I can't answer that right now. Uh, somebody wants to know how we're going to be evaluated. We'll think of something. Don't worry. For now, just take notes. Uh, so viscosity and surface tension will decrease as temperature increases. So if you, uh, if you pump something at high pressure with using rubber seals and on top of that, you make it hot, rubber tends to get softer. It, it decreases its viscosity. You might just blow the seal. So they don't, uh, typically on power washers, they'll tell you don't use them with hot water, don't go over 60 degrees, you're gonna damage the seals if you do. Also, it asks in the second part of the question, what happens if you inter increase intermolecular forces? Well, then both viscosity and surface tension will increase. So, uh, increase of intermolecular forces will increase both viscosity and surface tension. Then the last thing I did some notes on, and I'm going to have to probably stop now because I really got uh, no more notes for you on this chapter, but I'm going to make some more today, uh, is the, the different names for all the phase changes. So going from gas to liquid to solid, I can just read through, I mean, this is great nine level stuff. From, if you go from a gas to a solid, it's called deposition. Although I remember they used to say the same word, sublimation for both gas to solid and solid to gas, but in the book it says deposition. If you go from a solid to a gas, it's called sublimation. If you go from a gas to a liquid, it's called condensation. If you go from a liquid to a gas, it's called vaporization. If you go from a liquid to a solid, it's called freezing. And if you go from a solid to a liquid, it's called melting. And uh, each of those phase changes has a specific amount of energy attached to it based on how much material you're melting or freezing and what material, material you're dealing with. Incidentally, vaporization and condensation will have the same energy for the same amount of material. The only difference is the sign will change because in one case you're putting in energy. Okay, for, for vaporization you gotta input energy and then when something, when the same material is condensing, it's gonna output the same energy that it took to vaporize it. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there Tomorrow, I'm going to give you more notes on this chapter. We're not going to linger on this chapter. It's just basic background knowledge that you need to know to succeed in chemistry. The next thing I really want to give you formal notes on and start doing uh, problems, which you really need to know how to do, is the one on acids and bases and kinetics. Unfortunately, all my notes are in Toronto. So, uh, what are our midterms being based off of? Uh, well, what the stuff I already have. What I have now, that's what I'm going to calculate your marks on. Uh, what I'm thinking of is uh, maybe you can email me a result if I give you some questions to do. In your case, because you, you guys have the, the textbook in hand, I always give you open book tests anyway. So it's not too hard for me to just say, okay, do these three or four questions and then email me the results. And... Uh, and then I can uh, I can mark them that way. It's not that's not a big deal. But let's just not worry worry about that just yet because I'm I'm probably gonna have uh, my email is massimo.botsi at tcdsb.org. It's always first name last name at tcdsb.org. I just don't like to say that on the internet because you never know you might get some weirdo doing stuff. 
right? So, uh, yeah, but I'll let you know when we have a test. In the meantime, just read through, give a read through to chapter 11. Tomorrow I'll give you the rest of the notes for that, and then we'll start, uh, we'll start the next chapter, okay? See you tomorrow.